Thank you very much for joining us for this very special occasion, WJT Mitchell's lecture, Present Tense 2020, The Iconology of Time. My name is Daniel Carey, and I'm director of the Moore Institute at the National University of Ireland, Galway. I'm delighted to say that over 125 people have signed up for today's session. The dislocated temporality of the COVID crisis has been one of the defining features of this moment, which we are still contending with, of course. I very much look forward to Professor Mitchell's discussion. Apart from welcoming you, I wanted to say two things. First, that this event forms part of NUI Galway's contribution to Galway 2020, our year as European Capital of Culture. The university has generously funded a number of projects, including what was intended to be Professor Mitchell's in-person appearance here as a visiting fellow. We hope we can remedy that uh, defect soon, but we're very fortunate to have him here today to speak to us. And additional support has come from the College of Arts Research Support Scheme. My second agreeable task is to introduce our chair for today, who has been the driving force behind this event, Professor Paolo Bartoloni. Uh, he has led the way with the organizing committee, which consisted of myself, Nessa Cronin, Adrian Patterson, Al Putnam, and Elizabeth Tilly. Paolo is established professor of Italian studies at NUI Galway and a member of the Royal Irish Academy. Among his many publications are the books Objects in Italian Life and Culture, Fiction, Migration, and Artificiality 2016, Sapere di scrivere Svevo Igli Ordini di Coscienza di Zeno 2015, and On the Cultures of Exile, Translation and Writing 2008. Paolo, over to you. Thank you, Dan. Um, I, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, we have been working over the last two years uh, to bring about these events with WJT Mitchell and uh, uh, several people have been working uh, behind the scenes to make these, uh, these happen. The first, as you indicated, as an in-person series of events in, in June uh, 2020 uh, to coincide with Galway as the um, capital of European culture. And then, as we know, COVID-19 um, came about and uh, we went into a different a mode. Um, so we thought that we had to go ahead somehow with these two events and we then decided to move it to this kind of remote um, platform and here we are uh, today. Um, but there are a number of, of people and institutions that I would like to thank. Uh, Dan has already indicated that the, the College of Arts, Social Sciences, the Celtic Studies at NUI Galway uh, was instrumental uh, by providing funds through the Research Support Scheme Initiative and also NUI Galway for funding these two events to celebrate Galway's designation as European Capital of Culture. Um, I would like to again to thank all colleagues in the organizing committee, Dan, uh, El Putnam, Nessa Cronin, Elizabeth Tilly, and Adrian Patterson for the many fruitful discussions we had over let's say, the last two years uh, leading to these, uh, to these events. Uh, the Moore Institute, for hosting the events. The two external respondents, Janine Kraft and Timothy Stott, for accepting our invitation. Enea Bianchi and Arianna Pagliara for designing the, the wonderful uh, poster. I uh, would like also to thank David uh, Kelly, who is somewhere in the background there to make sure that technology is working and behaving. And of course, I would like to thank very much Professor Mitchell for sticking with us and being with us today, although uh, virtually. Uh, I would like to say a, a few words about the format. As you know, um, today's lecture is the first of two events with the double JT Mitchell. The second one will take place uh, tomorrow at 4 p.m. Uh, via Zoom on the topic of art, community, and resistance. And I'm really looking forward to seeing as many view as possible tomorrow. Um, the format of the two events will be exactly the same. So it means that uh, Professor Mitchell will talk for about uh, 45 minutes. Um, these, uh, um, these address will be followed by um, two uh, responses after which there will be time for Q and A uh, session. So if you would like to ask 
ask uh, any question. Anytime you wish to do that, then uh, follow that through the question and answer function on, on Zoom at the bottom of, of the screen. I think you have that uh, possibility of doing that. Um, I'm truly delighted to welcome Professor Mitchell. It's an honor to listen uh, uh, to and dialogue with the leading expert in visual culture and initiator of the pictorial turn. Uh, professor uh, Mitchell is Gaylord Donald Distinguished Service Professor of English and Art History at the University of Chicago. Is the editor of the leading journal of cultural studies, Critical Inquiry, and author of uh, uh, several books. I, I will mention only a few today. Picture Theory in 1994, Who Do Pictures Want, 2005, Image Science, 2015, A Mental Traveler, A Father, A Son, and a Journey Through Schizophrenia, 2020, an editor of the groundbreaking volume of Narrative, 1980, a book that had a great impact on me uh, as I was writing my uh, PhD in the early 90s. I, I read that book with immense pleasure and interest, and that book really formed part of my, of my thinking. Um, Professor Mitchell has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the American Philosophical Society. His books have been awarded several prizes, including the Gordon E. Lane Prize and the Charles Rufus Mori Prize. Um, I met actually Tom in Florence uh, at, at a conference on uh, um, the interface between uh, society and museum. That was in March 2019. And I was greatly impressed by his talk. And I thought, well, uh, we need to have him in Galway. And I have to say, it wasn't difficult to convince him to be here. Um, and I learned back then that, uh, that Tom has Irish uh, origin. So we really hope that we'll be able actually uh, to bring him over in person in Galway in the near future. In the meantime, let's enjoy him virtually. Uh, the title of today's lecture is Present Tense 2020 on the Archaeology of Time. Thank you. And to you, Tom. Thank you very much, Paolo. And I, I want to thank the Moore Institute and the University of Galway. Uh, it's a great honor to come to what I think of as my ancestral homeland. Uh, if you take one look at my face, you can see that I'm Irish, I think. Uh, my ancestors from County Cork, however, I think are lost in the mists of time. And that's my topic for today. Uh, the, the question of time. My methodology uh, is not uh, particularly rigorous uh, with respect to the philosophical question, what is time? I will leave that to Heidegger. Uh, uh, the being of time, its essence is beyond my uh, reach. So this is going to be an iconology of time. That is uh, thinking about the ways we depict, imagine, shape, uh, present time to ourselves in language, uh, visual images, and uh, for that matter, in musical forms as well. Uh, th this will be a spontaneous talk. I'm not going to try to read um, because the essay is too long. And besides, it is in print, uh, in critical inquiry. Uh, by the way, this is a plug for critical inquiry um, with apologies to Harley Davidson. Uh, it was uh, published in the December uh, 2020 issue of critical inquiry. It opens with, uh, with the following sentences. This essay is written in the present tense about a tense present. Located somewhere between the time it takes to read this sentence and the collective insanity that Nietzsche ascribes to an epoch, it's an impossible or at best experimental project, constantly overtaken by events that require rethinking and therefore rewriting in real time. Uh, the only thing I have been sure of in the last year uh, was that I was living in an epic that as Nietzsche describes it, uh, 
it's characterized by insanity, not just the statistical rise in mental illness alongside the plague, which killed millions of uh, human beings all over the planet, but, but also a sense of uh, collective craziness. Uh, and particularly in uh, democracies, which are falling apart. Uh, it's a time when everybody, I think, understands that the notion of a self-governing society, a demos, uh, is in big, big trouble. Uh, the United States experienced an insurrection as the capstone uh, of the year, uh, an attempt to overturn the results of an election of the president of the United States, a violent insurrection that seems to have been planned uh, well in advance. And uh, it really did serve as a kind of coda to a remarkable year. So the essay really has two purposes. One is to uh, think about the year 2020, present tense 2020. And let me start sharing my screen now. This is the last you'll see of me for a while. Uh, okay, I hope everybody can see that. As I say, the the talk has two purposes. One is to one is to think about the year uh, and uh, what it meant. The other is to uh, reflect on time itself. One thing that struck me uh, throughout 2020 uh, it was the way everyone kept talking about time, uh, saying what a strange time this is. I remember a year ago this time people were saying the year 2019 seems like a different century. It's so far behind us and things are so different now. And the moment I'm speaking in now, uh, a lot of people in the US are saying, well, at least that time is over. Now we are back to normal. Uh, I think the uh, feeling of complacency of normality may be uh, uh, a little premature, but uh, uh, the prematurity is part of what uh, human experience of time has to be. It, it, it is. So here's my epigraph. Uh, this is, by the way, this lecture is part of a book about madness, uh, collective forms of madness particularly, but also about schizophrenia and gifted uh, intellectuals who have uh, experienced schizophrenia, uh, but mostly about groups, parties, and nations. But this particular chapter is about the epoch, uh, the particular time. Uh, so the first question uh, I think we need to ponder in an iconology of time is where we are. Uh, what standpoint do we take on time? Uh, and I'm inspired, of course, uh, by the uh, example of Walter Benjamin, who in his thesis on the philosophy of history uh, chose Paul Clay's Angelus Novus as his icon of perspective on history. As Benjamin put it, this is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned toward the past. Uh, his back is toward the future. Where we perceive a chain of events, he sees one single catastrophe which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage. A storm is blowing from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm propels him into the future to which his back is turned while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. The storm is what we call progress. Benjamin wrote those words in 1940 at a time perhaps somewhat similar to ours, but I think even more serious and dangerous because the world was plunging into a global war uh, a war between fascism and uh, the, the global democracies, which could have gone the other way. Uh, there was nothing that guaranteed victory. Uh, Hitler could have won and established the Thousand Year Reich. Uh, uh, Mussolini could, uh, his descendants could still be in power as um, uh, rulers of the new Italian empire, uh, the new Roman empire. 
So it, it, I think Benjamin was in a worse condition than we are, that we comparatively uh, are, are somewhat lucky. But we, what is our present? How can we picture the, the way we are situated? Uh, I turn to my favorite pragmatist philosopher, William James, for an answer to the question, what is, what is the present? And here's his answer. The present is the prototype of all conceived times, the short duration of which we are immediately and incessantly sensible. The specious presence has a vaguely vanishing backward and forward fringe, a saddleback from which we look in two directions into time. Now, I think James was probably thinking about something no longer than a day. I want to ex expand this to think about a present that is dilated into a full year, uh, maybe even longer than that, uh, a, a period of relatively short duration, which we think of as our present moment. Uh, so, but the thing I want to focus on in James's uh, remark is the embedded metaphor in it. And that's the figure of the saddleback, the saddleback from which we look in two directions into time. We are in the present looking into the past uh, with our back to the future. Uh, so uh, where does that picture come from? I have no idea what James had in mind, but here's what it immediately evoked for me. Uh, the figure of the Italian peasant uh, Cacaseno, whose name uh, you probably know means something like uh, uh, shitting on the sovereign uh, the, or the monarch. Uh, as the inscription says, Kakaseno is apologizing uh, for not being a deep thinker. It says, I rarely fish the depths because I ride my horse backwards. I do it to go as the world does. So this is going to be my angel of history. He's more of a peasant. Uh, he is not standing to look at time or opening his wings to the winds of history, he is ambling forward and perhaps his horse isn't even moving. He could be stalled. I feel like for a lot of people, that was the experience of time, especially for us scholars uh, during uh, the preceding year, during 2020. That is, we spent a lot of our time sitting, uh, looking at screens, uh, writing, thinking about time. There's another figure who I feel is even more closer to my point of view uh, or to my sense of what an angel of history might look like. This is Sancho Panza, who also rides his horse backwards or his mule, sorry, uh, looking wistfully back into the past on the flesh pots of Egypt, as Cervantes puts it the feast that is going to go on at the wedding of a, a, a rich man uh, that uh, Sancho has been forced to leave, as if he's looking back into the past wistfully as a time when things were good. And I think that was also a sense of the pandemic here, that we were unable to move, perhaps stalled in place, and looking back on a time that in retrospect seemed much better than the present. I don't know whether I can fit Buster Keaton into this uh, pantheon, but I think it's, it's worth uh, using this metaphor of the saddleback and the writer, who in my case is also a writer, uh, moving through time, ambling through it uh, with one's back to the future, but twisting in the saddle to try to get a glimpse of what's to come. So let me take up the, the central concept that uh, Nietzsche insists on when he talks about the madness of uh, periods of time. That is the idea of the epoch. What is an e epoch? Uh, this is the standard definition. It's an event or a time marked by an event that begins a new period or development. Uh, the second meaning, an extended period of time is also true. So it is simultaneously, uh, epoch refers to two quite distinct ideas. One is the event, 
of the moment, uh, the point in time. And the other one is the interval, the, the length, uh, whether it's uh, a week, a year, in this case, it is a year, and perhaps something more than that as well, uh, if we think about uh, our time as one in which democracy has been undergoing a very fundamental test. The related word epoche uh, comes from ancient skepticism, and it's the uh, act of refraining from any conclusion for or against anything uh, as the decisive step for the attainment of ataraxy, which uh, I take it means something like serenity, uh, that we can't know some things, uh, we can't conclude, we can't be certain. Uh, it's also associated with phenomenology and its attitude of refraining from judging. I would add that in some sense, the psychoanalytic dialogue is a, a form of epoche in the sense that uh, the analyst refrains from judgment, allows uh, a kind of serene moment in daily life uh, to allow whatever uh, free association occurs. So certainly 2020 was a time of suspension. It was an, both an epoch and an epoch. It was a time of an event, the pandemic, and uh, the time of suspension. Uh, many of my friends uh, compared it to the movie Groundhog Day, in which every morning you wake up and you feel like, you're on a treadmill, uh, things are starting over the same way. And I think I should say, by the way, this is very much a view of time from the standpoint of a scholar. Uh, if uh, I were writing as an essential worker uh, who is on the front lines, uh, a worker particularly in the food industry, people had to eat and grocery stores remained open. They were perhaps one of the most dangerous places to work uh, and even to visit in the United States during this period. So it would be a very different talk if I were writing uh, as an essential worker rather than, I, I suppose we scholars in some sense are inessential, but we are here to do what we do, which is to ride the horse, uh, the mule slowly into the future and to think about it as we go. So, what were the images that are going to be remembered from the year 2020? What were the icons of the epoch? Uh, of course, the, there was this moment a year ago, a little more than a year ago, when the invisible enemy was unmasked. Uh, it was shown to have a shape like this, uh, not a human enemy, uh, a viral biological enemy, uh, an, an entity too small, uh, to be seen by the human eye, and yet completely deadly to masses of people. The, the, this model of the coronavirus, I think, resembles a deadly depth charge which can sink a ship. But there was also something, a secondary image that I want to focus on, which is more than the virus itself, which it may be familiar, but I don't think it captures very much, except perhaps the sense of deadliness uh, of a, a poisonous pill uh, with spikes on it. And what I found more interesting was the way that, that not the virus, but virality, the circulation uh, of the invisible enemy uh, through all sorts of different surfaces, places, locations. Uh, th this is, um, a model of the operational loops of a pa pandemic uh, that accompany an essay that appeared last year in Cultural Politics. It is the uh, what they call the transcalar architecture of COVID-19. And as you can see, it's a kind of uh, network or series of pathways through different surfaces uh, from the virus particle itself to bodies to, through infrastructures like transportation, cruise ships, airlines, uh, to states like uh, Ireland, uh, England, uh, Italy. We watched as 
different states, we, a rival in those states uh, would occur. And then finally, in tech platforms. But how did the virus arrive in tech platforms? Uh, we talk all the time uh, in information science and computer science about uh, computer viruses, that there are uh, viruses within uh, the, the information economy as well as in the biological economy. Those uh, viral patterns began to show up as part of the daily news. Uh, and uh, I'll quickly run through a few of them. One of them is simply that the time we were experiencing was coming to us in waves. It was not homogeneous. It was not empty. Uh, it was uh, cyclical and it involved peaks and valleys. Uh, I got used to this as uh, the daily news. Where are we on the timeline? Are we in a trough or are we at the peak of a wave? Uh, and it was a way almost as if we were saying, what is our collective temperature at this moment? Uh, is our nation experiencing a fever or has the temperature cooled down? At the very same time that the biological virus was circulating and producing a sense of intensified temporality and then relaxation, uh, hope and fear, uh, an, another kind of uh, temporal cascades and structural virality was accompanying this. Uh, and that was the, the incidence of fake news on Twitter and uh, other social media. Uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology conducted a study which was published in Science three years ago, actually, March 2018, which had already looked at this. And I haven't seen any uh, similar uh, diagrams for the structural virality of fake news in the year 2020, but I'm pretty sure it's very high. Uh, I think we, we all uh, could testify to that. Uh, the, the scientists at MIT came to an interesting conclusion. They, they found that there's one simple fact about falsehood uh, in social media, and that's that it spreads faster as a function of novelty and emotional impact than true uh, information. Surprise, fear, and disgust outweigh anticipation, sadness, joy, and trust. Uh, it, uh, lies uh, fly, and the truth comes limping after it. This was Jonathan Swift's conclusion uh, more than 200 years ago. And uh, I, I think it is only exaggerated, exacerbated, really, by social media. But it was always part of what you might call the information sphere uh, of human life. Uh, what is taken to be uh, the latest news, uh, the rumors. Uh, the Romans had a word for this, fama, uh, which generally involved falsehood, uh, the idea that the most viral form uh, of information is the falsehood, the lie. So those waves of falsehood accompanied the waves of the virus. So you might say a kind of information toxin, uh, a pathology accompanying uh, the bodily uh, toxicology of the virus. So those I would call something like the shapes of time in 2020. But then there is one other thing, and that's a human face. Everything so far has been uh, abstract. It has been a sense of a feeling associated with being in a time that is shifting, uh, that is going through waves and cycles. But one human face emerged, and it also, like the virus, went viral, uh, it went all over the planet. It was itself grounded in a time image, a nine minute and 29 second video taken by a teenage girl uh, of the murder of a black man in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, 
And one of the big questions people immediately started to ask was, in the midst of mass death, when hundreds of thousands of people were dying all over the planet, this single death suddenly became uh, the icon of the moment. It uh, circulated to every side of the globe, uh, murals all over Europe, and I'm gonna show a few of these in a minute. But first I wanna just reflect on the nature of this image as a time image. Uh, Luca de Baldo has uh, rendered it in oil uh, in a triptych which shows basically the same moment, but slightly different. You notice that the cop's posture is slightly different. One thing we can say about th this image uh, is that it shows uh, a human death treated with complete indifference with a kind of calmness, uh, a, a kind of uh, serenity even, uh, that this policeman shows little signs of anxiety as he crushes the life out of a human being. The other thing is that it was a time image in the sense uh, discussed by uh, Deleuze in his great book on cinema, Cinema 2, which is about images that do not move, but that express time. You feel time passing in them. So in cinema, it's that moment when you have a long take and nothing happens, but you feel time passing. I'm going to link this now to an, another reflection on time. What sense of time made this moment possible? In fact, made it inevitable and a recurring kind of event that is not just a, a one-time occasion. Uh, I'm sure none of you have heard of Deathorn Graham, but if you were a policeman in the United States, you would know about the Graham decision, and you would know that it it's a Supreme Court decision uh, from 1989, which canonized the concept of the split second. The nine minutes and 29 seconds uh, that Derek Chauvin uh, took to extinguish the life of, of uh, George Floyd was from a legal standpoint, only a split second. Uh, it happened because uh, it had to be evaluated from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene rather than with the 2020 vision of hindsight. The calculus of reasonableness must embody allowance for the fact that police officers are often forced to make split second judgments in circumstances that are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving. This was a nine to nothing uh, decision of the Supreme Court. And the astonishing thing about the trial of George Floyd was that of course, this was the fundamental defense uh, of Chauvin's behavior, uh, that he was acting in an emergency situation and therefore had to make uh, a decision on the spot. And that of course, as you can see from the picture, he's behaving without anger, without passion, is quite reasonable. All of that, I think, converged in a moment that uh, of incredible temporal intensity for the population of the whole world. People were at their screens, like me. I'm sure all of you were at your screens uh, watching this unfold. Uh, and so George Floyd's image became one of the things that will certainly be remembered as a monumental event uh, of the year 2020. Uh, it expresses a completely different dimension of temporality that just happened to coincide with this extraordinary year of suspension, the epoche uh, imposed by the, the virus. Um, these uh, four murals, by the way, come from uh, Europe, America, Latin America. Um, this one uh, from Belgium. Another version, uh, of course, there are secondary images aside from the community representations. And by the way, I'll talk about these tomorrow when we talk about art, community, and resistance. But there were secondary reflections like Luca Del Baldo's painting. This one from The New Yorker uh, by Kadir Nelson uh, is, uh, I think, especially profound uh, it, it, because it, it turned George Floyd into what he really became, a kind of black leviathan, 
uh, comparable to Hobbes Leviathan with the following difference. With Hobbes Leviathan, everything is turned toward the sovereign figure. Uh, the, there are no faces looking out at us. They all look toward the monarch, uh, the absolute ruler who holds the instruments of religion and war in his hands. Uh, with Kadir Nelson's image of George Floyd, his body contains all the faces of the victims looking out at us, uh, going back to the earliest ones along his belt line, uh, an engraving of uh, 18th and 19th century slave ships, the holes in which hundreds uh, of African-American slaves were, were shackled together to make the, uh, the middle passage. All of these faces have proper names. And in fact, the title of this picture is Say Their Names, which is a kind of mantra uh, of the community resistance, the resistance to forgetting, the resistance to anonymity, uh, the insistence on particularity and the identity of the victim. So in a year when millions of anonymous victims of the virus uh, were uh, dying, the death of this man, became this kind of icon for a community. Uh, this is just a list of all the things uh, that have been said when particular people, uh, particular African-Americans uh, have been struck down by police violence. Okay, well, I wanna summarize now uh, the, the dimensions of time that were converging in, in the the year 2020. And I wanted to build this around not so much the concept of uh, community, but of what the Greeks called the demos. Uh, the, the demos being the citizens, the people who are uh, members of a polis who potentially are capable of self-government. Uh, the, the kind of fundamental unit uh, of the great dream of democracy. My sense is that the character of 2020 uh, was produced by the convergence of four demics, uh, that is catastrophic uh, and violent uh, interruptions of the life of the demos, of its ability to reproduce, uh, to go on and to express agency. The first of course is the pandemic. Um, the pandemic, is an event which uh, some people feel now is passing. Uh, we hope it is, but it was accompanied by an upsurge of something that's endemic. And let me elaborate these terms a little further. What is endemic to our species? Uh, apparently racism is. Apparently uh, the, the sense of the, the strong and the weak of oppression, uh, inequality, uh, of the inability to really produce a democracy in the sense of a culture. Uh, it's an endemic feature of our species as we have great difficulty in doing that. Uh, democracy is a real project, an incomplete project, and it's uh, deeply compromised by the persistence of this endemic condition of hatred of the other uh, and uh, prejudice. Then there is the infodemic, the, the viral uh, transmission of fake news, the structural virality of, that I just talked about. Uh, and finally, a background to all of this was the sense that climate change was no longer something to be thought of as in the, in the distant future, but even in our saddle, ambling through the present, we could feel uh, the planetary crisis bearing down on us, uh, the great acceleration in climate change. I don't know how things are in Ireland. I hope it's just rainy as usual. Uh, but in the U.S., the uh, West Coast had massive fires uh, surpassing the records, record keeping going back a century. Uh, and it'll be even worse this year because the uh, a century long drought is coming to the West Coast. Meanwhile, in the Southeast and in Texas on the Gulf, floods 
uh, and hurricanes and storms of unprecedented ferocity. So an ecodemic, that is the planet itself, the ecology of our environment, rising up and saying, pay attention, I'm here. Uh, these four structural viruses, to me, were the uh, fundamental character uh, of this moment. Um, so at, in looking at all this, I kept trying to ask myself, uh, is there what Benjamin called a dialectical image that captures the year? Uh, here's Benjamin's definition uh, of a dialectical image. It's not that what is past casts its light on what's present or what's present its light on the past. Rather, image is that wherein what has been comes together in a flash with the now to form a constellation. In other words, image is dialectics at a standstill. For while the relation of the present to the past is purely temporal, uh, uh, continuous, the relation of what has been to the now is dialectical. It's not progression, but image suddenly emerging. So what was the dialectical image? I'm sure you, uh, if you ask yourself this question, many of you will have your own candidate and I would be happy to hear what you think it was. Uh, mine is incredibly simple uh, and I haven't figured it out uh, completely. It just immediately struck me when I saw it that this was the thing I will carry away from this year. Uh, the mask, of course, reminds us of the, uh, the virus itself and the virus as an attack on the, the, the pulmonary system, on uh, uh, the respiratory system. I can't breathe is literally what the mask does to us. It inhibits our breathing. It restricts it, uh, confines it. Uh, it, it also expresses our fear of breathing. We, we had to hold our breath for a year, and that was part of the sense of the time. Uh, I imagine some of you perhaps are now able to gather with a few vaccinated friends, and you have discovered that hugging one of your old friends is one of the great pleasures of life. You missed it uh, incredibly. At the same time, uh, and as my caption says, I can't breathe turns out to be the last words of at least 70 black vic victims of uh, police violence. That is the smothering of the victim, the, uh, the cry, let me breathe, let me live. Uh, George Floyd said that numerous times as he was dying and uh, it could be heard on the video as well. This mask also brings back a whole series, at least in American culture, I don't know if it has this kind of resonance uh, in Europe. Uh, during the AIDS crisis, a previous plague, uh, the, the, the mask became a symbol of silence, but also of contamination and contagion since nobody understood how AIDS was transmitted. It was also uh, a metaphor for a restriction on speech uh, one cannot speak of some things, speech is forbidden. Muhammad Ali, then Cassius Clay, was accused frequently of being a blabbermouth. He had too much to say, and a black man should be silent. Uh, so he produced this self-portrait, uh, which I think will live forever. Uh, and then finally, there was, uh, in the 1960s, uh, as I was a young man, the sentencing of Bobby Seale, his gagging uh, in the courtroom to keep him from challenging the authority of the court. Okay, so let me sweep to a conclusion here. Uh, so far, I haven't been talking very generally about iconology, but one thing about 2020, I think we can all agree on is that it was a very good time to do some thinking about time. So the uh, next few minutes, I'm just going to report on those thoughts. What does it mean to think about time as an iconologist, to think about it as a set of forms, a set of faces and figures? Uh, first, the basic abstract forms. Uh, 
the geometric shapes of time seem built in at least to the English language, uh, and I think of many other languages, that time is a line, uh, a line that goes on and on, but is also a line that can be cut, that can be short or long, the lifeline, uh, the timeline, uh, I mean, all of those graphs of the virus, of course, had a, a fundamental axis, the x-axis. Uh, death was the y-axis, the vertical axis, uh, but time uh, and death were triangulated in curved lines that wove up and down. Also, it's possible that there are multiple lines, and uh, if I had time, I would elaborate a bit on the, the notion of the homogeneity or uh, solidity of that line. I tend to view it as a thread with many uh, fibers running through it. Uh, this is Wittgenstein's suggestion for how to think of concepts themselves, concepts never being settled, uh, never being final, but always segments of a line through which numerous fibers of thought are passing. The circle then is of course our sense of repetition. Uh, today is Wednesday, it will be Wednesday next week. Uh, the, the, the year goes through a cycle, uh, the cycle of the seasons, the daily diurnal cycle of day and night. Uh, we can't really talk very much about time without the language of circularity and repetition uh, coming into play. And then finally, there is the point, the moment, the instant, the split second of police decision making, which in the case of George Floyd was dilated into nine minutes and 29 seconds. So the, the split second uh, itself is not a singular quantity. It is not a second. It could be a minute. It could be nine minutes and 29 seconds. The time of the event, the day of an election, for instance, is a point in time, has a definite date. Uh, in the United States, it was November 3rd last year. Uh, the insurrection occurred on January 6th. And we'll remember those points in time, those dates, but they were points uh, that were assembled within cycles and on lines. These three geometric figures I link to the classical personifications of time. Uh, I think, that, in fact, I think this is a fairly precise uh, uh, correlation. Father time, Kronos, uh, Saturn, uh, is usually portrayed with a sickle or a knife that he uses to cut the timeline, because Kronos is the figure who uh, not only shows the age and long duration of time, but also the fact that it doesn't go on forever, uh, that everyone's life uh, is cut short. And if I, I had more time, I, I would take you into some of the other iconography where Kronos and Saturn and uh, Jupiter uh, are portrayed as killing their own children. Uh, it's an image I'll return to at the end. The second is the figure of Ion, uh, the figure of the zodiac, uh, of the cycle of seasons. Uh, the seasons here in this mosaic are portrayed at the, at the bottom. Uh, Ion, uh, the god of circular cyclical temporality is at the top. And then finally, uh, Kairos. Kairos is uh, the principle or genius of the moment. And uh, this is what he looks like uh, up close. You'll notice that he has very strange hairdo. It is uh, a kind of uh, allegorical hairdo. Uh, the saying that goes with this image is uh, Kairos or the occasion, the opportunity, the moment, uh, when it comes, you had better grab it by the forelock, because if you don't grab hold of it, it will get past you and there'll be nothing to grab hold of, except that bald head, nothing to hang on to. So it's the fleeting character of the point. The point in time comes and goes. Uh, the date of the insurrection comes and goes. 
so if we put point, uh, circle, and line together, a geometer would tell you, you get what's called a resultant. Oh, I should have mentioned, by the way, that um, Salviati portrays Kairos here with a razor in his hand and a scales. So this is not only the moment of opportunity, it's the moment of decision. It's, uh, and it's the instant of decision that police, uh, the, the, the split second doctrine is also a moment to decide between life and death for someone. Uh, so uh, he's connected to the figure of justice, but also clearly of injustice. Uh, if I had time also, I would point out the uncanny resemblance of Kairos's hairdo to uh, a recent president of the United States. But back to the question of geometry, just for a moment. What happens if you put line, circle, and point together? Uh, the geometrical resultant of those three figures is the spiral. Here I show it in two dimensions flat, but it could as well be uh, a vertical uh, unfolding spiral of this sort. Uh, this is one personification of ion, of cyclical time, but at the same time as the ruler of eternal time, of the very long line, uh, uh, ruled by force, as the lion's head suggests. This became an emblem of the uh, eternal character of the Roman Empire and a, a kind of logo for the emperor as the ruler of the world. That's why he stands on top of it. It also, in the 19th century, uh, in 1790s particularly, became for the, my patron saint of poetry and painting, William Blake, uh, a figure of revolution of the fall of tyrants and sovereigns. Uh, this is of uh, the American Revolution and the, uh, the British occupation uh, of North America as falling into the abyss uh, while the American revolutionaries rise up. In Blake's uh, story of America, by the way, he accuses uh, the British of, of Albion's angel uh, of sending plagues towards America, but the Americans repel the plagues and cast down the invaders. Uh, Blake was very fond of the spiral image and he saw it as the moment when that the point uh, and the cycle and the line converge in, a, in an epoch. Uh, a moment of revolutionary transformation, which of course he felt in the 1790s was the character of his moment. So let me wrap up with one final diagram that builds on this idea of the spiral or vortex character of time, of both progression and repetition, and sometimes convergence on a specific point, whether it's a split second, uh, an epoch uh, or a period. And I want to suggest there are four vectors of time that go into our experience of it. Uh, one of them is just pecu peculiar to us as individual human beings with our own timeline. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, near the end of my timeline. I've had a long life and a wonderful, lucky life. Uh, some of you are much closer to the beginning or in the middle, but we all have uh, our sense of where we are in our time uh, as individual organisms. And it's our memory, our ability, while we're sitting in our saddles, uh, to look back uh, through that time to see the whole line stretching out behind us. Then there is collective time, the time of us which might begin simply with our family and our sense of uh, genealogies that go beyond our individual time, but also to political uh, national notions of time, uh, the, the, the idea of regimes, dynasties, and moments of revolution, uh, myths of origin, uh, the stories that we tell ourselves uh, about who we are. That's also a dimension of time that is part of our own personal experience of it. And finally, there are the, all those devices 
that we invent to measure time, to keep time, to count it, uh, all the, all the non-human mechanical devices. And this is why our understanding of time is continually evolving because we have new devices. Uh, the, I'm very fond of the hourglass uh, as a timekeeping device, but clearly now that we have computers, the clocks in our computers are keeping a quite different time uh, in some ways beyond our imagination. And then the final vector of the vortex of time uh, that is nature, the uh, seasons, the annual cycle, the planetary cycle, but also the geological cycles and the sense that we are on the verge of a new era in the history of the earth, that the, the Anthropocene is a time when human beings have become as big a factor as rain. Uh, there's no, uh, I think, more simple way to put it. Uh, we, we now uh, are experiencing a change in our entire environment caused by us. So last images, this which appears on the poster for this uh, event, uh, this is the portrayal of Father Time uh, here, uh, not eating his children as Goya shows Saturn or Rubens, uh, but eating the planet Earth, surfing on the clock face. Uh, meanwhile, white doves of hope come bursting through a cleavage in the dark sky. Uh, and uh, we have to ask ourselves, is this it? Is this where we are? That uh, our time as a species, uh, our time as inhabitants of this planet might itself be in danger. Uh, the rising tsunami certainly suggests that. Um, the doves of hope, uh, which actually one of them looks more like a predatory bird to me, uh, it, it suggests some possibility that at least if we can see ourselves this clearly, see what we're doing to our planet, uh, then uh, perhaps there is hope. But I want to not let that be the last word. This is, I think, an incredibly pessimistic image with only a glimmer of hope suggested by the white birds. Uh, instead, I want to suggest uh, a counter image uh, from the world of African-American culture. This is from the African-American artist, Betty Saar, who lives in Los Angeles. It's called Searching for a Vision of Truth. It is a doll's trunk and it has two heads. Uh, in that sense, I think there's a kind of pun on the names of the objects, the trunk of a body with eyes in it, but also two very different heads on top. If we look at the other side, if we open the wings of the doll's trunk, we see a clock and a planet. Uh, I like to think of these as Father Time and Mother Earth. Uh, Father Time is clearly the body of memory of uh, African-American time for the last 300 years, 400 years, since 1619, when the first slaves started to make the, the Middle Passage. And you can see that embossed on the chest of Father Time uh, is the engraving of the, of the Middle Passage with the captives chained together. Uh, Mother Earth is somewhat disassembled. Uh, she has what look maybe like crutches made of uh, antlers, perhaps moose or elk antlers. Uh, uh, a pair of eyes at her feet looking forward and a body assembled uh, out of vases. Uh, I'm very much haunted by Betty Sars. Uh, vision of searching for a vision of the truth. This is uh, a search which involves an angel of history opening its wings, looking back into the past, uh, looking at the history of slavery, uh, but the resilience and endurance of a people who can carry this forward with them, who don't leave it behind, who don't think, okay, now we are free and we, uh, uh, we never look back. In fact, we carry everything from the past with us. In this case, it's carried in a portable 
uh, uh, form, uh, namely a trunk with the dolls, which are the totems of our community. So that gives me perhaps a good place to uh, end off. And tomorrow it'll be about art, community, and resistance. So Betty Saar will uh, help us move into that uh, discussion. Thanks very much for your attention. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and come back to the real world. Um, thank you, Tom, um, for this wonderful uh, lecture. And, um, uh, I would like to, to invite straight away the two uh, respondents um, for today's, uh, that's Nessa Croning and Janine Kraft. Um, and Nessa is lecturer in, um, in Irish Studies and Social Director of the Moore Institute for Humanities here at NUI uh, Galway. And Janine Kraft, welcome Janine. Again, is Professor and Chair of History of Art and Visual Culture at Columbus College of Art and Design in the US. Um, so I would uh, pass the virtual floor on to you, Nessa, perhaps, so you can um, make the honor and, uh, and start the ball rolling. Thank you. I, I think actually maybe Janine might be going first, if that's OK, Paolo. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep it on that side of the Atlantic for the moment. Well, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nessa, and thank you to the Moore Institute for um, asking me to be a part of this discussion. Um, I am going to read my remarks uh, today, so just to let you know, uh, but they won't be too long. Um, Mitchell's work in dealing with the problematic nature of writing the contemporary with its ever-shifting landscape immediately invokes the framework of time that is at the heart of his search for the iconology of the epoch. He explores the complex socio-political horizon of the epoch, initially in the American context of the rise of fascism and systemic racism, as well as the particular moment of 2020 amidst the global pandemic. Notions of time and our understanding of it were particularly relevant in 2020. The pandemic seemed to stretch time and make us hyper aware of its preciousness. In the lead up to the 2020 US election, we were poised at an uncertain moment uh, in terms of its outcome. A swath of the population held its collective breath with a cautious sense of hope, mitigated by a pragmatic dread, knowing a huge percentage of our population was quote unquote, willfully ignorant, uh, a term coined by Barbara Applebaum in her study of DEI issues. What Mitchell describes as Kakasano's obscured vision of the future. It was a moment in which time seemed long and drawn out, the pause between events as described by George Pobler. As many of us who had the privilege to isolate uh, during the crisis, we are now re-emerging into traditional notions of time after our time was frequently mediated through screens as it is today. We are stuck in this push-pull between the past and imagined futures. In the US, the Capitol riot on January 6, 2021 was a pivotal, pivotal moment in that pendulum swing with a potential loss of democracy, although an imperfect democracy and the potential victory of racist fascism, the Nietzschean collective madness. Time stretched out slowly over the course of the day. At the same time, we seemed to be hurtling down into the abyss. The optics of this played out on screens across the country and the world. I watched these events unfold with my 12-year-old son, uh, terrified of the potential future and heartsick that this could happen in our country. I clearly understood the power of Trump and his followers, but held an idealist core that democratic ideals would prevail after the election. I had long held the belief that these contemporary international authoritarian movements were the last gasp of the past, desperately trying to retrench in the face of grassroots calls for change, such as the Black Lives Matter movement in the US, which spiraled out globally. This mutability of time is at the heart of teaching of history. We wrestle with students' notion of the static nature of the past and must shake loose that notion of past time and its ever-evolving nature in relation to the present. Whether through our discoveries of lost knowledge or context that changes our understanding of the past or through our changing contemporary condition which shifts our interpretation of the past. The latter has been foregrounded in the field of history of art and visual culture studies as in other fields and has been brought into sharp focus in light of the socio-political events of the last few years, forcing us to be even more hyper aware of and self-reflective about the nature of what we teach and how we teach it. As George Rung Young, writing in The Guardian last week, phrased it, quote, but history is not set in stone. It is a living discipline subject to excavation, evolution, and maturation. 
Our understanding of the past shifts. Our views on women's suffrage, sexuality, medicine, education, child rearing, and masculinity are not the same as they were 50 years ago and will be different again in another 50 years, unquote. It is an ongoing dialogue between past and present understandings. In the Toka Arts Festival 2013 catalog, artist Mary Rue muses on the future of photography and Gilles Deleuze's notion of the ion. This dialogue is, quote, a kind of time traveling, the past um, and future constantly in our mind, so feeding itself, unquote. Images of the past inform our contemporary understanding of place, mutability of the past that conditions our understanding of the present. In his essay, Mitchell asks us, how do we picture the times at this moment? And is this a teaching moment about the nature of time and our times? He examines, as he did today, images of the epoch, such as uh, the images of the virus, statistics, graphs, images of racism, as well as images of the past. I would add to that discussion the images of Black Lives Matter protests, Trump rallies, the Capitol riot, the images of masked and unmasked faces, lockdown cities around the world, images of climate change, and the burning of the pandemic dead in India. The visual arts and culture have a role to play in reframing uh, the narratives of our time. In the realm of the arts, there are many visual challenges to the narratives of oppression and injustice. These images have the ability to translate and convey complex concepts. The activist power of images is particularly relevant in the US context in images and video of the injustices of racism, which were pivotal in bringing worldwide attention to the endemic racism of America and our police system, as we looked at here today. In the context of Ireland, artists uh, like Lukas and Nedelkovic use art to advocate for social and spatial justice in areas such as the system of direct provision. As we emerge from lockdown, the recession of the pandemic, and a more reasoned, for the most part, government here in the US, uh, what should replace the icons of the past? Again, in his essay, Mitchell asked, as the American monuments to white patriarchy come down, what should rise in their place? George Young's article in The Guardian was entitled, Why Every Single Statue Should Come Down. He argues they are, quote, poor as works of public art and poor as efforts of memorialization, unquote. This epic is one of global crisis with the rise of fascism, the issue of systemic racism, the pandemic and global climate change. As we attempt to address these critical global issues, we have broader publics to engage who don't have the visual literacy to interpret representations. So we need to cultivate new publics through alternate means. We need to engage a non-visual literate demographic and not through means of propagandistic celebrations of power. We, we don't have the ability to engage in collective uh, visual allegories due to our split nature of our experiences. We can't agree on iconic figures of the past or the present. I would advocate for work that is anti-iconic, communal, activist, international, but not, or, sorry, informational, but not didactic, centering on themes of healing and exposing our flaws. One of the ways to move forward is through social engagement or even using the exhibition as a critical space of engagement what James Voorhees describes as beyond objecthood. Art that engages in activist and inclusive, inclusive reading of space and place, engaging the agency of art to shape, change, reimagine, and potentially reform the broken systems that govern the existence of life in the 21st century. President Michael Higgins in his keynote address to the American Conference of Irish Studies last week hosted by Ulster University, hailed the healing power of art. In discussing the conference themes of heritage, hope, and healing, he said, quote, we need to attempt, even metaphorically, to relive the past tactfully in the here and now. Only then can injured history be transformed into healing present and a future of promise, unquote. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Janine. I think it's over. Back to Galway now. So um, I also just want to say thanks very much um, to everybody for the invitation to be here today and also um, to Professor Mitchell as well, who I think I think definitely after a year of us doing all of these things on Zoom and the Moore Institute, you definitely win the prize for the best Zoom shirt anyway. So you get my vote on that. <laughs> these, these things are very important. Um, so I'm just going to make just a few remarks uh, because I'm conscious of time and the time being the subject of the day, but also the time of the day that it is.
is uh, both on both sides of the Atlantic um, and also that there are probably many other people in the Zoom room as well that might like to ask questions and, and to join the discussion um, afterwards. Um, so I just have three just observations and they're more like sets of propositions really to uh, explore this idea of the uh, kind of a critical iconology of time. I, I think it was really interesting that that's your intervention in, in this area as well. Um, and a lot of my remarks will follow on very nicely from Janine as well. So um, first of all, uh, opening up the idea of what the APOC is and the idea of the present tense 2020, um, I'd like to move into thinking about the future tense of 2021. Um, so this kind of this back and forth of past, present and future. Um, and while in Ireland as well, we've emerged from a crisis of capital that we experienced with the global financial crisis of 2007-2008, uh, we've, we also very much are within the midst of the climate cri crisis. Uh, we don't have the same fire, uh, the extent of the fire and drought that you have in North America, but we have lots of uh, flooding, particularly in Ireland and other attendant issues around that. Um, and this has really affected lots of ways of thinking and being in terms of our sense of time, uh, not just because of we're in the Anthropocene, but also the present moment for the next generation, what kind of a planet and what kind of a place are we leaving to the next generation and the question of responsibility of elders and of the present generation for the, fu the future generations to come. And thirdly, and these all seem to be with C's, capital, climate and COVID, we are just now emerging out of the third crisis um, over the last decade, um, that of the global pandemic. Um, and I think it was really interesting, you were you know, noting uh, as well the idea of the pandemic, the endemic, the infodemic, the ecodemic. Um, and one term that has emerged, I think, uh, and it's in to be, it's a, a it's pending approval with Collins Dictionary is the term pandemicide. Um, and it's noted there that uh, that a pandemicide is negligent, negligently allowing a pandemic to take hold so that many more people die than was inevitable. Um, and this is this has been entered in since the 25th of March 2021. So we're now in the in the era of generating new kinds of ways to talk about these new phenomena in this new period of time um, as well, too. Um, I was also very taken with your idea of the, the, the specious present and the specious moment and what the specious actually is. Um, and I think that very neatly kind of ties into what you were you know, discussing in terms of the question of truth and knowledge and, of course, all of the, the infodemic kind of uh, challenges that are there as well, where something looks superficially plausible, but is actually wrong in many ways. Um, and I think this kind of crisis of knowledge and expertise and information we have as counterbalance of the expertise of science on the one hand, but ignoring it on the other. And we've seen that with the climate crisis and also then the challenges to science with, with, the, with the pandemic as well too. Um, so I think that's, that's been a very interesting observation. Um, from the Irish perspective, um, the, the kind of the interventions that have happened in Irish critical thinking and Irish uh, critiques, I think, and some of the writers I'm going to mention now have actually published, I think, in Critical Inquiry as well and in Boundary as well that you're probably familiar with. Um, in particular, I'm thinking of the writer of David Lloyd, whose book actually Irish Times Temporality of Modernity should be on everybody's reading list. Um, and uh, his interventions into the, the place of Ireland um, and other such countries as well within the European Enlightenment project of modernity. Um, and this idea of progress of what modernity is that Ireland throws a spanner in the works in, in that in many ways. Um, so I'm just going to read a little bit of David Lloyd because he says it far better than I ever could. Um, so he just says, uh, this is from uh, Irish Times, Adorno and Horkheimer's thesis on modernity accommodate only one imminent form of the contradictions of modernity. The value of a post-colonial critique of modernity that emanates from locations once considered peripheral is that it supplements the recognition of the internal contradictions of modernization with the apprehension of other forms of unevenness, forms of unevenness that call into question the historicist narrative that understands modernity as the progress from the backward to the advanced, from the pre-modern to the modern. Um, and I think that quote really encapsulates a lot of what you were working through and also I think in terms of what Janine was responding to in terms of opening up other questions of time, of history, other narratives, other voices and in a way creating other spaces, not just in the present but actually to go back to look at a radical history and a 
radically different kind of project of what modernity is and a counter modernity or a counter push that happens. And there are remnants and traces of that there. We just need to be more attendant to them and to spot them, I think, uh, is what David Lloyd is arguing for as well. Um, equally as well, um, the other kind of key concept that really had a resonance for me in a way was this idea of um, opening up the space of a new commons and, and you were you kind of touched on that in, in your essay in the published essay. Um, and with that, I think it's a really interesting project. And again, it ties into what Janine was saying about the idea of opening up these discussions to other publics and to other having other conversations. Even the Zoom platform we have today is a new type of public commons, one could argue, uh, in some way. Um, and here I'm thinking as well of the feminist scholar uh, Silvia Federici from her wonderful book, Reenchanting the World, Feminism and the Politics of the Commons, um, where she argues that commons should not be understood as happy islands in a sea of exploitative relations, where we're all taking mindfulness classes or something or zoned out on our, on our, yoga, on our yoga mats that have been expensively bought on Amazon. Um, but she says, rather, they should be autonomous spaces from which to challenge the existing capitalist organization of life um, and labor. Um, and I think that your work is really signaling a lot of that, that kind of push and that drive to open up a real critical evaluation of what the commons is and what the intellectual uh, project of that could be. Um, and with that, I'm mindful as well of our positionality as scholars as well and as educators, primarily working in a university institution where our job is to teach um, and that our, our job is to teach our students not what to think, but how to think. And so it's that, that, that distinction between information and knowledge that you were pointing to and also that Janine touched on as well, uh, as well too. Um, finally, the third point um, I just want to make is you make a reference to it uh, towards the end of your paper on uh, Walter Benjamin and his arcades, his wonderful arcades project. Um, and I'm just going to read the section from Benjamin again uh, because it just it's so uh, latent and I think it's it speaks so much to where we are right now. Um, where he, he writes, for a while the relation to the present of the present to the past is a purely temporal continuous one. The relation of what has been to the now is dialectical. It is not progression, but image suddenly emergent. Um, and it was that idea of an, um, a kind of an emergent image or an emergent reality that kind of started ringing little alarm bells in my head. Um, and I was immediately thinking of Raymond Williams and his structures of feeling and the, the, the arguments that he has about the dominant landscape that we inherit, the residual landscape that's there. So this is kind of the David Lloyd argument. But very importantly, there is the emergent landscape of the, the not yet, the, the as yet to come and um, that we might only get glimpses of. And maybe that's us on the horse looking backwards and getting little glimpses at the side with our little really bad peripheral vision that I have in, in particular. Um, and Raymond Williams talks about this uh, in where he says again and again, we have to observe what we have to observe is in effect a pre emergence active and pressing the not yet fully articulated rather than the evident emergence which could be more confidently named. So that we have to allow a space in our discussions and our dialogue and our thinking for that kind of incommensurability, but also the not yet named the un Samuel Beckett's unnameable, if, if you will, in some way. Um, and finally, uh, with this, I've been reading uh, the work of uh, sociologist Boa Vista de Sousa Santos, who's been writing about the question of epistemicide, um, how the global north has created epistemic monocultures. And again, it's a critique of the European Enlightenment tradition and the critique of modernity and how the global south is, needs to push back or has pushed back in different ways. Um, and he writes about the role of the artist in this, uh, which is really important. And he, he, he says, and I quote, that the artist, she specializes in the not yet, the emergent, the latent, the potential, whatever is on its way to be recognized and to add innovatively to the artistic present. Um, and I would argue here that as well, it should be about adding to a more socially progressive future in many ways as well, too. Um, finally, there was a webinar yesterday, and we'll make reference to Michael D. Higgins. Again, our president has been very busy uh, since he took office. Um, there was a webinar with Noam Chomsky and uh, Michael D., our president, Michael D. Higgins, talking about academic freedom and intellectual dissent uh, with scholars at risk in Europe. Um, and they spoke very much, very strongly about the need to keep these kinds of 
spaces open and in particular the role of the university um, for these kinds of um, spaces for what we call now kind of emergent landscapes for this kind of thinking, uh, which is very, very important and um, all the more so now than ever. Um, and I'll finish just with a quote by Donna Haraway, who writes about these things as well in relation to the climate crisis and acknowledging the political context to which she was writing in 2016 in her book, Staying with the Trouble. But her argument is that we have to stay with it. We have no choice. Um, it's, it's the argument of, of the, the teenage girl who took the, the video um, of, of, uh, of Floyd's murder, you know, the, the, the strength and the courage to not look away. And it's that kind of strength and courage that we have to stick with in some way. Um, and Haraway writes, and I'll, I'll finish with this, um, the task is to make kin in lines of inventive connection as a practice of learning to live and die well with each other in a thick present. Our task is to make trouble, to stir up poten potential responses to devastating events, as well as to settle troubled waters and rebuild quiet places. So, thank you. Thank both of you, uh, Nessa and Janine. Uh, those are wonderful responses. Um, I've been talking a long time, so I think this is a time to let, if people have questions, uh, they should chime in now. Uh, can we uh, take some questions from the audience? Yes, yes, indeed. Um, just uh, looking at the question and answer um, function, and they're coming in, uh, so that's that's great. Um, and thank you again to Janine and Nessa for their wonderful um, uh, responses. Um, I will actually select some uh, as I as I go through, and uh, uh, please uh, uh, for forgive me if I miss something. I will um, uh, ask this question on behalf of other people. For instance, the uh, Ankur Kansal. Um, that's the question. I will read it. It's a longish one, so bear with me. How do we deal? with the problem of hindsight inherent in the notion of epoche. In this case, wherein we are always looking at time that has passed from a standpoint to which we refer to as the present. How do we instead think about an iconology of the inner duration in bracket Bergsonian, the felt, uh, the experienced a duration of uh, waiting, uh, and in, in bracket, George Floyd himself didn't know the period nine minutes plus some seconds. His resistance against time to convince the devil that he isn't resisting the arrest. That's that's a question. Um, um, whether uh, um, Tom, would you like to to answer to that or? It's a very uh, a difficult, complicated question. Uh, I don't know if I have anything adequate to it. Uh, the, the, um, I think uh, Mr. Consal is proposing a hindsight as a problem that could be solved uh, that uh, inherent in our, our sense of, of being creatures who live in time, uh, who are always filled with plans and memories. Uh, you know, this little brain of ours is a machine for coordinating past and present constantly uh, with some glimpse of, of possible futures, all of our ambitions, dreams, hopes, and those have to do with our own self, but also with the, the, the society we inhabit, uh, the planet. I mean, I think it's characteristic of our time. In some ways, I don't have any answer for you, uh, uh, Ankur. I am uh, simply ambling along on my own mule, like uh, Sancho Panza, uh, having a conversation. Uh, I, I think you're probably on your mule somewhere too. Uh, and uh, so I don't know uh, there, there's any way of dealing with the question of hindsight. Uh, it's interesting that that word hindsight is crucial to the doctrine, the legal doctrine of the split second decision. 
uh, in American police work. Um, hindsight is ruled out. Hindsight, uh, the decision that was made in the moment is final. Uh, and a review of it, which says, no, it was wrong, it was incorrect, uh, it, it was a crime itself, that was ruled out nine to nothing by the Supreme Court. So to me, hindsight is not a problem, maybe. Uh, I'm, I'm really just thinking out loud here. I think hindsight is uh, absolutely necessary. That, that is what history is in some way. It is a discipline of hindsight uh, and of, of uh, we hope, um, a process of correcting hindsight and making it collective in the first place. So we try to find a common past. We try to, it, it, I think like Betty Sarr carrying with her the doll's trunk, which is her hindsight, looking back on father time, mother earth, carrying them with her uh, into some future. The, the trunk of her doll's, uh, her, her doll's trunk has eyes that look into the future. I always think of our, our backs are to the future. That's why it's, it's so hard to see, but it isn't impossible. Uh, in fact, we can feel it. We, we glimpse it on every side. Uh, so this idea of moving backwards, with, which Benjamin also knows as well, the angel of history, his angel of history was facing a much more catastrophic situation. Don't forget, he wrote those words, what, a few months before he took his own life uh, at the Spanish border. Uh, uh, our situation this year as scholars, we have been the lucky ones. We've been able to kind of amble along in our saddles. I felt I, I had a sabbatical this year. That's so hindsight was a great pleasure and privilege uh, and limited glimpses of foresight as well, all of which are impinging on this moment. It's not a, so I don't know how to deal with the problem of hindsight. I, in fact, I want to turn it from a problem into a solution. Let's think about it together and constantly correct it. Uh, let's not accept the split second decision as fate. That uh, That's what the justice for George Floyd amounted to. Um, thank you, Tom. Um, there is a question by Anthony Rayleigh. Uh, talking of time and history, the year felt quite medieval uh, to me. Um, we have been here before, um, and thanks for acknowledging uh, key workers, by the way. Well, thank you, Anthony. Uh, but I'm very interested. Why do you say, uh, I want to ask you a question. Why do you think uh, it felt medieval? Um, I'm not, uh, what do you mean by that? We can answer live or type an answer. <laughs> Possibly the limitations of the Zoom. Uh, we'll see if uh, yeah. Anthony will come back to us with uh, yeah. um, an answer. Uh, Anthony, yeah? Yeah, it's a bit, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, yeah, we do. It felt, it was a, a feeling medieval of, uh, obviously, I mean, in an obvious sense with plagues and what have you in the past. But um, it was a, a phrase I heard a lot was the science. And I wasn't quite sure often what the science meant. And that in itself felt like a medieval kind of concept. Like there was, uh, we were gonna be saved by um, something that we all agree on, the science. Which sound, it's felt at times to me to kind of be non-scientific in the way that uh, some doctrine, and if we all agreed on, you know, discovered that doctrine, we would be, um, find salvation very much just a feeling sense it felt medieval in that way the way the way the way we were responding emotionally even if it was just in the press and what have you yeah but what is the what connection to, were you saying science uh, i mean there was uh, a i don't there was a phrase that was often referred to especially by government a lot yeah is the science we're following the science trust, trust the science. What, which which science and uh, whose opinion and what have you, but we often heard, you know, we're, um, we're being led by the data, we're being led by the science. And that was, a, that, that was a term I heard a lot over the last year, the science. 
which yeah. again that felt a bit medieval again in that uh, there was some um uh if we just had faith in some sort of doctrine if you like and we would be safe but that seemed a bit odd to me because that that felt almost not scientific mm, yeah science as faith rather than it it was a, a quite a dance i think uh in this country since immediately uh science was transformed by uh the president of the united states into an object of political contestation remember the mask i showed uh the, at first dr anthony fauci our kind of leader of the scientific community addressing uh, the virus uh, in February, he said he wasn't sure masks were necessary because they didn't really know yet. Uh, they, they thought it was just as important are gloves. Turns out it wasn't really, uh, touch was not the medium of transmission. It was mm -hmm. droplets in the air. They didn't, but uncertainty. To, to me, what was medieval was the, the transformation of science itself which is a mode of inquiry, open, skeptical, mm -hmm. provisional, always uh, you know, filled with uncertainty, transformation of that into an ideological position. Maybe yeah. that's what was really medieval. Yes. It was yes. the denial yes. of science uh, and the, the treating it as a matter of faith. Uh, you know, what, what is the relation of faith and science? I do have some faith in science, but not as a system of belief, as a system of inquiry. Uh, for, for Donald Trump, science was uh, a kind of dogma to mm -hmm. be either upheld or opposed. And he calculated that it was good politics for him to oppose it. Don't wear your mask. Don't socially isolate. Uh, the virus will pass. So we had the, um, the the American sovereign, uh, and he really believed he was the sovereign, still does, uh, espousing a, an irrational faith, an anti-scientific dogma, uh, because he thought it would produce political power. And in fact, in some ways it did. Uh, he managed to, there's still people, the denial, refusal to get vaccinated uh, is <laughs> its own pandemic. We're still not even up to 70%. Jump in there as well. Actually, I think, Anthony, I think you're, you're, you're spot on. And I, I, it was very interesting to see a similar rhetoric happening on one side of the Atlantic in Ireland and then in the UK as well. Um, and I think a lot of that, the, the science argument that happened during COVID actually is um, a hangover of the science argument about the climate crisis, uh, where people were arguing that, oh, you, look, the science is in, you know, it's the argument since 2015, since the, the Paris Agreement and, you know, COP25 and all of that, and all of the, the all the different scientific, scientific reports that have been cascading in, telling us we're, we're beyond tipping points, et cetera, to listen to the science, and now it's up to the politicians to do something. And I think that the pushback with COVID was a pushback against the climate argument as well, too. So it was a rejection of the science of climate and a rejection of the science of, of COVID uh, in a particular way. Um, and, uh, and also brings in, I think in the UK prior to that and prior to the events of 2016, this whole question as well of the role of the expert in society and the denigration of, the, of expertise as well. Um, that's all on the back of that again. So, so that there's, there's a lot going on there, I think in that moment about science and expertise. Um, and again, coming back to academic freedom uh, within all of that context as well. But I, I think you're, you're absolutely right, Anthony, with that. One thing that occurs to me, and that's the word again, in the slogan of the Trump era, make America great again. Uh, that's uh, the return of the past. Uh, and in Trump's case, it's a return of the uh, times of white supremacy. He is almost explicit about it. Uh, so it's uh, maybe that's another sense in which we, uh, I think it's, it might be a caricature of the Middle Ages. Uh, I, I think the time sense of people in the Middle Ages was probably as complex and varied as our own. 
uh, with different dimensions to it, but certainly the sacred time of uh, imminent ending, uh, that the plague will never end, the, that the plague is the marker of the end, uh, would have been, I think, a characteristic medieval attitude. Uh, and a lot of people, I think, have done uh, some work trying to think about uh, the, the way plagues were experienced and represented uh, in the past, uh, how they, uh, how people reacted, dealt with them. Um, it, I think it would be very interesting to do, to produce the dialectical images of that, because in some ways, some wanted to go back to that. It's an article of faith. The, the God will provide, the, the plague will pass. Uh, as Trump said, it'll just miraculously disappear. Um, we have a question from uh, Adrian uh, Pediton, uh, one of the colleagues in the organizing committee. Hello, Adrian. Um, on the visual representations of time, uh, the line, circle, and point collapsing into a spiral. And thus, Professor Mitchell or any of the speakers think the interlocking gyres uh, or spirals of Yeats, uh, who knew Blake's work intimately as well as the centripetal forces of the Vorticists. Um, a helpful image for the present, notwithstanding they arrived just over 100 years ago through the strange processes of his wife, uh, George's automatic uh, writing and a dark expectant view of the cycles of political uh, violence. I, I can just do one quick thing and then I'll throw it back over to you, the other two, but I would just say, in, you know, in, in my personal opinion, I feel like instead of looking to the traditional Western canon of the past for images of the now, we need to be looking at the now and the, the emergent um, and to bring in more diverse voices and perspectives to the conversation. But, I'll throw that over to. Yeah, as uh, as far as the um, the spiral, um, of course, my thinking about the spiral really uh, does originate with with Blake, and I think you're absolutely right. Uh, Yeats's gyre, uh, the the uh, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. The idea that something is escaping. Uh, that there's a turbulence in time. Uh, they, it was a very uh, prominent 19th century symbol, uh, of course, Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe, the descent into the maelstrom. Uh, the, and the idea that there is a still center of the vortex where time does not move, uh, where it accelerates as you go outward. All it, it's, um, it's a kind of background metaphor for, I think, a lot of, uh, of thinking about repetition in time, but also suspension, all the dimensions fused into one. That's why, I think, as a geometer, I think it is what we would call a resultant. It is the compound uh, image that takes those figures of linearity, circularity, and, uh, and the punctum uh, and, and puts them together. Um, Descartes also uh, was, was in a sense a vorticist. Uh, so it's, and by the way, I don't think it's just a Western image. Uh, the great map of the poles, uh, the, the, the yin and yang uh, relation is also, uh, that. it is the image of the dialectic as well. Uh, so uh, I know this sounds like high theory, but it's, it's also vernacular everyday language. I think that's a place to look for uh, some of these patterns, what George Kubler called the shapes of time. Um, they, uh, are they culturally specific? Um, are there forms of emergence? Uh, to me, the vortex is also a symbol of, uh, of revolution uh, and itself a, a form of the way emergence imagines itself as a kind of synthetic moment that uh, it takes the past and leaps forward uh, into something unpredictable. 
I might, I might jump in there as well, just um, to say uh, thanks, Adrian, for that uh, great question as always. Um, that Yeats as well, obviously, would be very much thinking of other concepts of time that he would have encountered from the the oral tradition in Ireland uh, with fairy lore. So, um, so here come the fairies. This, this is the fairy moment. Um, but you know that there's a very real understanding of that you can occupy a very different space-time continuum, and of course there's that space-time interconnection that they're not separate, that these are part of this one thing um, in, um, in Baelithus and in, in fairy, fairy lore as well. So whether there are actual places you can go in, whether it's a fairy fort or whether it's a cave or whether it's a certain mound on a hill, um, that once you enter it, you're, you're entering into another world, another space-time dimension. You can go there for 300 years and come back into the present. Um, and that's coterminous with the living present now. Um, so I think Yeats was very familiar with that there were other ways of being, we, you know, we might call it in terms of a, a decolonizing moment in Irish studies in the 19th century or whatever, but that, that he was aware of through a different Weltanschauung, for a better word, um, that there was this other kind of present sense of time in the Irish landscape um, and that he was working through with his translations with Lady Gregory uh, in that as well. So I, I think there, there might be something there that we could discuss again in another time. Yes, I, I feel like uh, the time of the fairies, in some sense, it was, the, the, you know, they, they have this phrase, the time is at hand. Mm -hmm. uh, the time of the fairies was in some ways at hand for some of us uh, this year because of the feeling of time out, mm. of suspended time in which I, at first I thought, oh, I will write my way through this. I will, I, I'll keep a log and mm. turn it into a blog and it will be uh, a daily writing. That's how I started writing this. And then within a couple of days, I realized my log is, is totally boring for one thing. Uh, so it became a log about about time itself. Uh, in fact, a critical inquiry a year ago uh, in in March, as in the onset of the pandemic, uh, we received an essay from Zizek about the you know just a short essay for the blog. They said uh, this, is, this is just my first thoughts on this time, and then uh, a, a tsunami of essays came in of uh, people wanting to write about the moment, about the time. And of course, you know, it, it, writing about the moment is never just about what's happening, but about the sense of the moment and its distinctiveness in relation to other moments. Mm -hmm. So it inevitably became a critique of temporality itself. Mm -hmm. So what I've been doing here is basically it grew out of my journal, Critical Inquiry, of its uh, a big conversation around this, much of it facilitated by this medium, Zoom, because uh, uh, we shouldn't forget this was the year that we began talking to each other this way. I have never traveled so far in one year uh, this year. That's, is that fairy time? Is that techno time? <laughs> fairy time. It's zoom, zoom, it is different. Time. We never did this before. We have to get that for your next shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it has been, you know, it has been the year of Zoom, no doubt yeah. about it. Yeah. I never heard of Zoom until March to 2020. Then somebody said, Oh, how are, how are we going to have this meeting? We've got to have a meeting, <laughs> make decisions. Uh, very strange. <laughs> But, uh, on, on, on the topic of Descartes, and then we move to another question. Uh, I was at a, a Zoom conference in France a couple of weeks ago, and uh, one lady had her tagline was "Covido ergo Zoom." So, <laughs> so I, I, I need to say no more after that. Very appropriate. <laughs> we have a question from Martin O'Keefe. Is it fitting in iconology that the image of Father Time is attached to the pendulum? Hmm. Well, did I show any images with a pendulum? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think you did. Martin, I'm, I, I don't recall any pendula in my, uh, uh, my images. Did you see one? I'll uh, wait for Martin to uh, get back to us, perhaps we move up to the, to the other question. Emily Rich, thanks for a great paper and also for introducing me 
to the very striking and evocative artwork of Betty Saar. Uh, I wonder if a trunk image is also alluding to Marcel Duchamp's Bois in Valise series, which was in itself partly a response to the World War II refugee crisis and the work of Walter Benjamin. Yeah, uh, before I go to that though, I'll just say, I think it's perfect. I don't know about fitting, whether it's fitting, it's not up to me to say whether Father Time should have a pendulum uh, or not, but uh, certainly, and uh, I, th whenever I think of the, the pendulum and time, I think of the terrifying story again by Edgar Allan Poe, the pit and the pendulum uh, in which uh, the pendulum is getting uh, going faster and faster and longer and longer as it descends toward the chest of the narrator who is strapped on a table waiting for it to cut him in half. Um, so that is like George Floyd time. The pendulum is uh, severing your life. Um, so it, it, the suggestion uh, from Emily uh, that um, the artwork of Betty Saar, um, I think that's a great suggestion that uh, uh, she was thinking of Duchamp's uh, Valise series. Uh, the idea of the portable work of art, the uh, work of art is to be taken along with you. Also, I think she's surely imagining the trunk as itself a kind of body. It's, uh, you know, I have a trunk uh, and a head. Uh, the, the, so, but yes, I mean, my answer is yes. I think that's a wonderful suggestion. I, I hope you'll let me steal it uh, when I uh, go on to finish this paper. Uh, I hadn't thought of it at all. And the next question, and the final one, uh, Enea Bianchi, who is the designer of the poster by which the way, Tom, and also a young scholar, and is about to publish a book on the Italian philosopher Mario uh, Perniola. Um, and he, he says this, the conception of time as a spiral has often been advanced by postmodern thinkers, such as uh, Michel Maffesoli, also to convey the idea a multi-layered dimension in which we can appreciate uh, pre-modern, modern, and post-modern practices and tendencies at once. Do you also refer to these when you talk about the image of time as a spiral? Thanks. Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, uh, no, uh, Michael Mafasoli is not on my radar screen, but he is now thanks to you. Uh, and uh, I, that's one of the things I've found this year with uh, Zoom conferences. It's wonderful. I get to ask questions too. And uh, uh, I've been getting a lot of very interesting suggestions from all sides of the world. Um, so the, the, the idea of the, the woven thread, the, the timeline to me um, is an, almost a misleading metaphor in terms of geometry, insofar as we think of the line as unidimensional. Um, and I think I mentioned Wittgenstein's in Philosophical Investigations. He talks about the nature of a concept. Concepts, he, he's not talking about time. Uh, I can't even remember what concept, but he's saying we have this mistaken idea that a concept is a kind of, uh, it's a word that it has a, an associated meaning uh, and perhaps an image that goes with it and that that's it. Uh, he said, actually a concept uh, is more like a thread of multiple ideas woven together, some of them contradictory. So. He said, think of the concept as uh, a thread with overlapping fibers, and none of the fibers go all the way from one end to the other. Uh, so that at some point, the concept may reverse itself, 
it may mutate into something quite different. Uh, in other words, I think Benjamin, when I think about a, a thread as woven fibers, the, then the line is already a spiral in itself. It's already got things woven uh, together. Uh, and that's when we talk about collective time. We say, is this our time? Is this happening now? And we are, we are here together in it. It's also a time that is weaving together multiple times and places in something we're calling the now, the present. So the spiral, I think, is the found. In some ways, to me, it's the foundational one. Um, the the others are the reducti, uh, the reductios of the spiral. Instead of thinking of it as the sum, maybe think of the others as extracted images out of the, the master image of the spiral. I might actually um, avail of my privileges as as a chair to. To ask perhaps a final question before we, <laughs> we wrap it up. Um, yeah. uh, I was struck by um, uh, the image that you chose, Tom, about uh, um, the year 2020, the mask. And yes. uh, as I was uh, looking at the, at the mask, I can breathe, and uh, the iterations of the mask, the bandages, I actually noticed that uh, um, many of the, of the senses are kind of shut the mouth, the nose, and possibly sometimes also the ears. So when it's a bandage, you see, they just come over here. So what's mm -hmm. left is vision, the sight, and touch. Mm -hmm. um, is this an image for, for the present? That uh, the way in which we apprehend the world is kind of curtailed uh, in a sense. Um, uh, that's, that's something that I was, thinking as I was watching that beautiful image that you presented. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure, Paolo, that's, uh, that's a great suggestion. Um, it, it's, it's such a multi-dimensional image. The, the, to me, the, the reason I took it was because it links uh, quite directly uh, the pandemic and mass death, uh, the end of the timelines of so many people, friends, strangers, uh, you know, acquaintances all over the planet uh, with the image of one individual. And that individual is somebody who is, contains within him uh, or surely does now a whole genealogy. Uh, the, the history of uh, the African-American presence in, uh, in this country. Uh, tomorrow I'm gonna I'm going to come back to this question because I live uh, in an African American neighborhood and I have lots of friends here and I'm involved in uh, very, very local political struggles uh, of all kinds that involve my own community. So, uh, recent days, finally, we're able to go to a cafe uh, together and hang out uh, and talk and shake hands, uh, even with some people. Uh, hug. So uh, to me, it's kind of a marvelous moment, not to mention the fact that it's summer and in Chicago, that is always welcome. That's great. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Tom. Thank you, Professor Mitchell. And thank you to Janine Kraft and Nessa Croning for the wonderful responses. Uh, it's always sad to bring something to a cause. Um, it was a great uh, uh, event, great evening. Uh, I really enjoyed it thoroughly. And I'm looking forward uh, to tomorrow's presentation on our community and revolution. Uh, so um, I'll see you all uh, tomorrow. And uh, uh, hopefully it's a, it's a good time in Chicago too. I think it's not too early, Tom. It's at the 10 o'clock, so I think it works well for you too, isn't it? It's, yes. it's not too bad. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, uh, just, uh, you know, almost lunchtime. Uh, <laughs> That's fantastic. Time. So, so we'll have a glass of wine um, to celebrate this. Yes. Okay. And, uh, will there be a different link for tomorrow? Uh, yes, and uh, uh, and David, and then we'll send that. Uh, um, um, well, perhaps uh, just a little bit uh, before the the meeting. I think Dan is on on screen now. Perhaps you want to say something Dan, about that. Yeah, David has just put it up in the chat, and that's for attendees. So that's for, so for attendees, it's available on the Moore Institute website and there in the chat. 
and then there'll be a dedicated one, one for you, uh, Tom, as, as a panelist and speaker. So uh, I'll send that again to you so you won't uh, hopefully suffer any, any confusion about searching for Zoom links, which is another feature of the moment. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Uh, wonderful to see, see you all. Look forward to tomorrow. Thank you. See you tomorrow, Tom. Bye. Bye, bye all. Bye. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.